I'd like to welcome everyone to this uh, special presentation, the, the launching of the Eastern Mediterranean Sepsis Alliance. Uh, this is a day to be celebrated. Um, I am Tex Kisun, the president of the Global Sepsis Alliance. And even though the Global Sepsis Alliance is just over a decade old, it has made tremendous gains in the number one killer in the world, sepsis. Under the guidance of uh, uh, Dr. Conrad Reinhardt, our first and founding president, um, we have been able to uh, launch World Sepsis Day, which is now going to be on September the 13th. Um, and it has grown in strength over the years. We have also gotten the World Sepsis, uh, the United um, Nations and the WHO to accept that sepsis is a global threat in our resolution in 2017. These have been major advances, but much work needs to be done. And over the past few years, we have been uh, uh, formulating regional alliances because as we all know, sepsis is um, a disease that depends on the various regions. There may be different organisms, different resources, et cetera. And these regional alliances, our goal was to form six um, in all areas of the world. This is the latest one. Our youngest one is the Mediterranean Sepsis Alliance. And today we'd like to welcome uh, the Eastern Mediterranean Sepsis Alliance into the family of alliances. I think that um, uh, under the uh, leadership, the strong leadership that I've seen, I think that this would make a great uh, uh, sort of uh, strides in the region to decrease the burden, the incidence, and, um, and also the outcomes, uh, mortality and morbidity from sepsis. With that in mind, I would like to uh, introduce uh, doc, uh, Dr. Abdulela Al-Hawasi, who has um, really been um, a very, very good addition to the board also of the Global Sepsis Alliance. Abdulela is vice president of the Global Sepsis Alliance and the founding director of the Saudi Patient Safety Center and the Ministry of Health Advisor on Patient Safety. He holds a dual certified board from the American and Canadian um, uh, boards of transplant and hepatobiliary surgery. Abdulela is a consultant to many national and international quality and safety organizations. And he's been a quarterback leading much of our initiatives at the Global Sepsis Alliance. He is part of the expert panel on the third world uh, global patient safety challenge of the WHO and shared the organizing committee for the fourth global ministerial summit on patient safety. He has helped introduce patient safety as a G20 priority in the 2020 G20 uh, uh, summit in Arabia. And with that in mind, I can see we have a very, very talented uh, panel here um, of individuals who you will hear over the next hour to hour and a half. They have really been leaders in the field across the world and they have made great strides in advancing the cause of sepsis. With that, I'd like to turn this over to Abdelayla. Thanks very much and have a great meeting. Thank you very much, uh, Tex, and uh, you know, thank you for your leadership and uh, for waking up early on, on the West Coast. And uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it's been it's been a very kind of a good ride for me. Uh, a short one so far, but uh, hopefully we're, we're we're looking for 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 a, for yeah. a very long and impactful, uh, you know, work together. Nine, nine. Have you? So my name is Abdel Al Hausawi. I'm a, a transplant and a hepatobiliary surgeon, and and uh, been uh, honored to to be the chair of the uh, the, the youngest uh, regional alliances of the Global Sepsis Alliance, as uh, Tex mentioned, which is uh, the Eastern Mediterranean Sepsis Alliance. Now, sometimes if you're the youngest, that doesn't mean that uh, you're you're the weakest. You know, sometimes you know you can you can be young, but you can uh, young and small is actually pretty. Uh, ha has has its own advantages. So we're uh, it 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 gets you to move fast and it gets you to to do different kinds of uh, uh, positive things uh, in 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 this field. So uh, what I'm gonna do, I'm I'm actually I'm gonna introduce our our panel first, and then 
what uh, I, I will uh, give a brief, uh, you know, uh, and short presentation, but we're, we're very much interested in having the, the dialogue uh, uh, with, with our esteemed panel, very diverse. I mean, again, if, if you want to solve a, a big problem like sepsis, I don't think you can, I can, you can get uh, any better uh, panel uh, to, to, to discuss these uh, issues. So I'm, I'm going to start with uh, Professor Conrad Reinhardt. Uh, he is, as Tex mentioned, he's the, the, uh, the founding uh, president of the Global Sepsis Alliance. And uh, uh, he's been the, 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 the main force behind the establishment of, 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 the, of the Global Sepsis Alliance with, with, with the core team uh within within the gsa but also uh with his leadership the world health assembly's uh, uh resolution the 70.7 which uh, was passed in 2017 is a very very important document and, I, and i'm gonna keep repeating this uh, wha 70.7 so at least by the time we're done this is like tattooed in your brains and in, in, in your memory uh <laughs> You know, this is a very important document, but we all know that documents alone do not, uh, you know, solve big problems. Documents alone do not, uh, you know, save the lives of millions of people. We have to have uh, action and we have to have uh, people like you to, to, to actually have that action. So, so uh, again, we're, we're very honored and, and happy to, to have him with us. We also have uh, Dr. Carlos uh, Urea, uh, who uh, pretty much is a very interesting, uh, he's got a very interesting bio. So uh, he's, a, he's a physician, uh, he's a, the global leader of medical affairs and clinical informatics in uh, Hilrom, but he's a physician uh, by training. He has served at many different places. So. Uh, uh, he was born and raised in Colombia, where he received his medical degree uh, and then moved to the United States. Uh, he's got a master in public health from nothing but uh, other than Johns Hopkins uh, School, you know, Blumberg School of Public Health. And he also has an executive uh, uh, degree from the IHI, uh, the Institute of Health uh, Care Improvement. And he uh, served also as a, as a, as a chief medical officer of, of one of the uh, big organizations. So, and plus his role in, in, in health informatics. So very, very kind of uh, interesting uh, background and, and, and diverse bio. And, and uh, we will, will be very much interested uh, to hear from him. We also have uh, Dr. Rasha Ashur, so she holds uh, several clinical responsibilities, including many academic and administrative positions at Sidra Medicine uh, uh, and at the national level in, in, in Qatar. She's a program lead uh, for sepsis and pediatric sepsis. And just to remind everyone, the, the World Patient Safety Day this year in, uh, in uh, September 17th has the uh, the theme of uh, maternal and, and 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 newborn safety and and you know when when you're talking about the safety of newborns uh, it, it is it is very much uh, in, you know uh, interesting to hear uh, her views about that uh, September is a very interesting month because it has a World Sepsis Day on the 13th of September which was actually uh, was was brought together by the uh, the World Health Assembly's resolution in 2017. And it's just a, a good, you know, an interesting coincidence that, that within that week, there were the, the uh, patient safety days on the September 17th. So uh, we'll be very much interested also to hearing uh, Dr. Russia's uh, uh, great efforts in, 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 in Qatar and in, in the field of uh, sepsis. And we also have uh, Dr. Emmanuel uh, Notes Tibo. I'm I'm sorry if if I if I mispronounce your last name. People mispronounce both my first and last name. So I'm I'm we're we're in the same kind of uh, you know category. Uh, he is uh, a board member of the Global Sepsis Alliance and uh, also member of the executive uh, 
committee of, of the Global Sepsis Alliance. So it's been a pleasure to serve with him. But also he's the chair of the African Sepsis Alliance, ASA, which, is, uh, which was the youngest uh, regional alliance before EMSA. So now they're like the second uh, youngest. Uh, but again, uh, ASA also has been very active in, in many activities. And hopefully through the, the discussions that uh, we will have today, we'll look at uh, potential collaborations between uh, EMSA and ASA. Uh, Dr. Emmanuel is a consultant uh, infectious disease physician and the chair of infectious disease at Czech, uh, Czech Bolt Medical City in Abu Dhabi. And he previously worked at the Royal Liverpool Hospital as an associate medical director for deterioration and uh, sepsis and clinical advisor for the National uh, Health Services. Again, very, very active in, in the field of sepsis. So I think with, with, the, uh, with the very diverse group that we have, uh, I believe uh, we'll, we'll have a very interesting uh, conversation. So my presentation is just going to, to set the stage of, of, of the discussion, but I hope that uh, A, uh you uh, you know you 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 send us also questions through 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 the discussion and we'll we'll uh, we'll, we'll try to take some of your questions and and ask the the the, the panels as, as we move forward so with that the the vision of of the global sepsis alliance is the uh a world free of sepsis and the whole idea is you know how can we bring that vision to reality and, and nothing better than kind of having the regional collaboration. So, and, and, and this is very exciting uh, to discuss uh, around the time of, of uh, IMSA's, uh, you know, uh, launch into the scene. So that's gonna be the outline of what I'm gonna talk about, you know, a little bit about IMSA, which we've discussed some, some ba basics uh, information about uh, uh, sepsis and again, uh, I am going to be repeating the WHA 70.7. So if you don't remember anything from what I said, you know, one of the th items to remember is the WHA 70.7. I, I want you to go and look it up and read it and memorize it and, and, and work on, on, uh, on implementing it. And the last point is what can we do at the Eastern Mediterranean to eliminate sepsis? So EMSA, it's the Eastern Mediterranean Sepsis Alliance, and it is, it is the, uh, the, the youngest alliance. That's our website. You could actually, uh, our website went live a few weeks ago. Uh, it was founded uh, in Dubai, in, you know, around April 2019. Now with, with COVID and everything, uh, things kind of uh, put, put the activities on freeze. So this is like the, uh, the, the, the the second, uh, you know, kind of launch of, 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 of the activities. And we really look forward to having uh, <clears throat> as many members as possible, uh, be it either uh, um, uh, uh, healthcare organizations, be it uh, uh, NGOs, be it individuals, be it scientific associations. So please, we would love to get as many inquiries as possible about how can I become a member and, and we'll, we'll be very happy to uh, reply to you. So sepsis, you know, as, as we know, and we've been living with this pandemic now for almost two years, uh, you know, COVID is a, is, a, is a big problem and it's got the attention of the entire globe. But guess what, you know, COVID, killed in 2020, 2.5, 2.6 million people. We're talking about a, 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 a disease and a problem that kills more than 11 million people. We're talking about a problem that afflicts more up to, uh, up to 50 million people. So even the people that actually don't end up dying from the, from the 50 million that get sepsis, uh, not every one of them actually go to uh, leading a normal life. Many people have, have a lot of uh, sequelae and, 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 and uh, problems uh, after sepsis. And uh, as Tex mentioned, it is the biggest killer. 20% uh, of the, uh, you know, in the Global Burden of Disease report, 20% of mortalities are due to uh, sepsis. 
So basically, you know, there are two ways to prevent sepsis. One is to simply just uh, prevent the microbial transmission of uh, uh, an, an infection. And this is the first phase. So anything that we can do to prevent infection by uh, applying the proper infection and prevention control measures, you know, hand hygiene, vaccinations, et cetera, uh, is the way to go. And keep in mind that even the, vac the vaccinations against different viruses, including COVID, uh, are very good prevention for sepsis because of the clear association between COVID-19 and sepsis as well. Uh, so so it, we're not discussing sepsis as a separate entity from, from COVID-19. Uh, sepsis, in a way, is, is, is the final uh, you know, uh, phase of, of the pathway of infection. So anything that we can do to prevent infection uh, from the beginning is, is a way to, 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 to you know, move forward. The other important thing is how can we uh, detect it early? So we prevent infection from evolving into sepsis. And, and this is where I think there's a huge room for improvement. You know, a lot of the uh, infection prevention control practices happen outside the, the, the healthcare facilities and, and inside, but also a very important uh, area that we can intervene is how can we recognize uh, sepsis early, and and I think uh, with the uh, with the kind of evolving technology, uh, there's there's a huge room for improvement that we could use to to really uh, you know uh, uh, identify and rec recognize uh, sepsis uh, early on before it evolves uh, you know infection before it evolves into sepsis. So going back to the WHA 70.7. So this resolution was passed uh, in 29th of May of 2017. The Global Sepsis Alliance was the main you know, driving force behind it. And you know, get your pens and, and, and papers and uh, your notepads for you, for those of you who are not familiar with it. Uh, I hope you start taking notes. So the resolution urges the member states to include prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of sepsis in the national health system strengthening. So any activities of national health system strengthening that does not have sepsis are not complete. And you really have, to, you know, in a way, sepsis is, a, is also a way to measure how strong systems uh, are because the higher the sepsis rate, the higher the mortality from sepsis, it gives you an idea about how, you know, the, the, the weaker the health systems uh, is and vice versa. So the second point was about highlighting infection prevention and control programs. And, 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 and uh, again, there's a big room for improvement and, and, and uh, multi-sectoral collaboration here is, is key. I, I think, I would love for the uh, healthcare leadership within 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 hospitals to to, re to really be champions of uh, promoting infection prevention and control, and not just leave it with the uh, the infection prevention control units, but to really make sure that uh, they are leading uh, in in this area, and make sure that whatever executive dashboards and KPIs that they're looking at, that they have. Uh, IPC as one of the important areas to look at. Number three had to do with, with uh, antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial stewardship. So if you don't have an antimicrobial stewardship in your hospital, in your medical city, in your regions, please, uh, you could start. And, and there are many uh, resources and programs that we can share with you uh, through the Global Substance Alliance, through EMSA, or through the WHO that can help you establish your uh, antimicrobial stewardship. Number four is to have standardized way of, of, of dealing with uh, you know, sepsis here. So to develop and implement standard and optimal care and strengthen medical countermeasures for diagnosis, 
and managing sepsis in health emergencies, including outbreaks. And again, I mentioned the association between uh, COVID-19 and sepsis. So COVID-19 is not kind of separate from sepsis. Number five is to increase the public awareness of the risk uh, of, of sepsis. And I think this is where the role of uh, uh, NGOs, patient uh, groups, et cetera, would, would be very uh, uh, helpful. So uh, I think we can always do more when it comes to uh, engaging the public, engaging patients and families. And I, and I think uh, hopefully under the umbrella of, of EMSA, we could also uh, push and advocate for more public awareness. And, and uh, we were interested to having also some uh, webinars, not just to address uh, professionals like yourself, but also we wanna have webinars to address the, the public. Number six is to develop training for all healthcare professionals on infection prevention and control, patient safety. Uh, so patient safety by definition is the absence of harm. And we all know that sepsis is preventable. So, you know, we talked about 47 to 50 million uh, cases of sepsis a year and 11 million of those die. I believe that the majority of those are preventable. So what are we doing to, to train healthcare professionals to, to, to deal with that? We need more research, especially in our region. So I hope that uh, uh, in collaboration with EMSA and maybe also having EMSA and, and, and ASA, the African Sepsis Alliance collaborate together, we could really scale the, uh, the research uh, in sepsis in, in, the, in this area. We can collaborate with, with, with universities and academic centers. And so if you, are, if you know of uh, researchers or, or physicians or students who are interested in research in sepsis, please uh, connect them with us as well. Uh, number eight is to apply and improve the use of the international classification of disease systems to establish the prevalence uh, of sepsis, and, and, and again, I'm highlighting also epidemiologic surveillance. So ICD-10, ICD-11 in the future, and how can we uh, leverage that uh, in, in terms of surveillance? Number nine is uh, coming up in 12 days. So today's September 1st. So mark your calendars on September 13th. What are you going to do in your hospital? What are you going to do in your medical centers? to uh, really use that date as an advocacy date to promote uh, sepsis uh, treatment, to, to promote sepsis prevention, et cetera. Uh, and there has been some asks from, from the WHO, which I'm not gonna get into, but you could, uh, I, I urge you all, if, you, if you're not familiar with this resolution to go and look it up. But <clears throat> again, 12 days from now, make sure that you do something to move the sepsis efforts forward. So what can we do in the, at the Eastern Mediterranean to eliminate sepsis? And these are some of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna quickly discuss. So highlight the, the sepsis bundle, you know? You could have different ways of trying to memorize it. So give three, take three, give high. So if you have someone that you think that they have sepsis, then you know, give high flow oxygen, IV fluid, broad spectrum IV antibiotics, take cultures, of course, before you start the antibiotics, measure the lactate, measure the urine output. This is uh, uh, basically three studies kind of li linked together and, 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 and the, the message is pretty clear. Uh, the, the earlier that you start the uh, antibiotic and, 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 and the more screening you have, the more lives are, are, are saved. And, and, and as you could see in, in a country like the UK from 2016 to 2018, both the, the rate of, of early uh, antibiotic use as well as screening went up. This is a, a, an, another uh, intervention from New South Wales in, in, in Australia. 
And just look at from the left hand side here in the, uh, at the prevention. So we talked about two ways to uh, prevent sepsis. One is to prevent infection. So that's the first line of defense. The second that if you have infection, then try to recognize it early. And this is what, you know, this between the flags means is if you recognize it early between these two flags, then this is where you could actually save many, many lives. If you intervene beyond that second flag, then, you know, with time, and this is the time, basically with time, patients could end up uh, dying. So again, the message here is to try to prevent it if you can, try to prevent infection if you can, try to recognize it early. And this, there's a huge room for actually, uh, you know, technology to help us here in this area. Again, this is, this is just another uh, way to, sh to, to, to show how this between the flags uh, happened between uh, the, the uh, you know, the, on, on your electronic health records. And, and the question is, how can technology help us here? Uh, different uh, uh, studies from, from uh, four different countries and three out of those countries managed to reduce sepsis mortality by 50% over five years when they uh, applied the sepsis bundle. So imagine if all countries had 50% reduction in sepsis mortality, we're talking about saving 5.5 million lives, you know, out of those 11 million. <clears throat> so to summarize what I said, you know, I talked about MSA, we talked about some background uh, information. I, I spent some time going over the resolution and I think there's a lot that we can do in MSA to, uh, and in the Eastern Mediterranean to eliminate sepsis. So with that, I thank you for your, your you know, uh, attention. And I think we would jump right ahead into uh, our panels. So I'm gonna start with uh, Dr. Conrad being the, the founding president and, and one of the biggest forces of sepsis uh, efforts globally. So Conrad, maybe just give us a little bit about uh, the, 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 you know, the background of the, the origin of, of uh, GSA for the, uh, for the audience here from, from the Eastern Mediterranean and the, the idea of how the idea of the regional alliances you know, came about and, and uh, you know, if you have any advice for us on how to move forward. Yes, thank you all for, and especially you for your kind words uh, and uh, to uh, resuscitate uh, EMSA, so to say, uh, after these uh, difficult times and just a few personal uh, words, uh, how I became intrigued uh, for sepsis when I started um, what at this time was called the Free University of Berlin uh, in the university hospital there. Uh, in 1978, uh, I realized uh, as a young physician on the ICU that um, sepsis at this time was already the main cause of death. However, I had not heard anything during my education at the medical schools. There was no guidelines. There were no data on the burden of sepsis. Um, there was no research. And there was no advocacy. And um, it took me quite some time uh, to understand that sepsis is not only an issue, it's for the intensivists, which is still in the minds of some policymakers right now, because the main bang for the buck is really to prevent that people progress uh, to the ICUs uh, by what has been nicely uh, pointed out uh, by Abdulela. And the problem is that patients with, CV, with infections or infectious diseases 
since 1950 have no longer a lobby and this is ironically due to the fact that at least in the high developed or rich countries like the US, the crude mortality rate for sepsis decreased from 1900, where, where it was 800 per 100,000 population to around 50 per 100,000 population in the, in the 50s due to better sanitation, chlorination uh, of uh, uh, water, vaccination, and of course, the development of antimicrobials. And this went along with a notion that this notion was expressed some by some surgeon generals in the US and, and health authorities that the book of infectious diseases might be closed. And this was, uh, first of all, just a few from the less than 20% of the population already at this time, meaning uh, the so-called high income countries. And uh, even for them now, we know that still in the US, sepsis is the number one cost driver uh, affording or costing around six or more than 60 billion US dollar per year. And nobody knew uh, what sepsis is. And even in the, the CDC, uh, the WHO, uh, until um, the last, until we started actually with these kind of global activities, for them, uh, sepsis was just an issue from in the context of healthcare associated infections and nobody realized that what we know now that 80% of sepsis cases come from the community and uh, we, we learn now and relearn the lessons that we could have understood already from the so-called Spanish flu in 1917 uh, uh, that this is really a global threat and, and we, we need to, to learn these lessons and um, that's why I think now is really a great opportunity because again and again and again here also the, the GSA was a driving force from the very beginning to make clear that such thing as viral sepsis exists and more and more uh, scientists and also authorities understand now and we have to learn one lesson which has been published in 1918 in science and the authors have been those who had responsibility for the Spanish flu in the US who said you need to take care of pneumonia, which at this in regular times, which was neglected also at this time to be prepared and to be able to better handle them when these kind of infections result to global pandemics. And this is one of the lessons we have to learn and also one of the opportunities because Unfortunately, only due to this global pandemic, uh, the media uh, and, and the healthcare authorities and the policymakers have understood that it was a great mistake to neglect and not to recognize and strengthen the healthcare systems accordingly to prevent not only pandemics, but to cope with the same rigor and passion the pandemic sepsis, which is there, and Abdullah has pointed out rightly that so far we have 4. million deaths from COVID-19. And this adds to these 11 million deaths that we have from sepsis from other causes. And that's why I am so glad 
that we were able to establish this regional sepsis alliance with the vision to work with the regional offices of WHO in every region to work with the national health authorities because without them, we won't be successful. And our goal must be the, the, what we set out in the World Sepsis Declaration in 2012, when we started World Sepsis Day, we said sepsis must become a household word, word everywhere and every healthcare professional and every decision-making policymaker has to understand this. And this was something, by the way, which was understood by the cancer advocates already in the 40s and 50s of the last century who said and understood that a disease needs to be transformed politically before it be, can be transformed and conquered um, scientifically. And, and, and that's, we are, and we need to come to equal footing with other diseases. And by the way, the number of annual deaths by cancer is 9.6 million. Fortunately, million. Fortunately, the number of deaths from HIV is around 0.6 million due to the fact that they were able to raise awareness. And this went along with better research, with better prevention, with better therapies now. So it's doable. And the quote by, by Dr. Tetros that's, and, and also what is also set out in this resolution that most cases of sepsis are preventively preventable. And this holds true not only for children, but also for adults. So this must be our guidance and our vision really must be zero preventable deaths from sepsis. And with this, I end and uh, yeah, encourage you to move forward uh, in the next years. Thank you very much, uh, Conrad. And uh, I, I actually, uh, this, this webinar and, 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 and many of the uh, activities moving forward, uh, we're, we're, we're gonna make sure that we have uh, collaboration with, with, uh, with, with all uh, stakeholders, uh, including the, the industry and, and uh, you know, if it wasn't for the great uh, support of, of Hedrom, uh, to sponsor this this event, you know, this event uh, would have would have not happened. So, so my my thanks to to Hedrom for 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 their support, and you know, we look forward to continued uh, collaboration with with them and and and, and with other uh, you know involved and, and interested uh, stakeholders in in in, in uh, sepsis prevention. So, I'm I'm going to go to uh, uh, Dr. Russia. Uh, just because, again, I, I, I want to highlight to the to the audience that on, on September 13th is the World Sepsis Day, uh, and on September 17th is the World Patient Safety Day, and the theme for the World Patient Safety Day this year is the safe maternal and newborn care. So we're talking about the safeties of, of both, and we know that uh, sepsis is one of the killers of, of uh, uh, mothers, uh, you know, with maternal postpartum sepsis. Uh, and we know that also neonatal sepsis is a major problem. So maybe Dr. Asha, if you could talk to us about uh, sepsis in, in, in the pediatrics age, but also, uh, you know, feel free to talk to us about some of the efforts that you're doing in, 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 in Qatar. And, 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 and again, uh, we, we, we look forward to making sure that uh, EMSA is a platform for, for collaboration. So, you know, learning from each other and, 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 and taking these activities forward is, is going to be key. So, uh, Yes, if you can uh, give us give us your, your thoughts on, on, on these issues. Thank you, Dr. Abdelillah. Good afternoon, everybody. 
just a small uh, correction for, for myself. I am working in Sidra medicine, yes, but uh, for Sidra sepsis, it is the pediatric neonatal woman oncology and adults in the post transplant units. So we are covering a huge area for uh, our multiple services at Sidra, but in the national board, it will be the pediatric national sepsis program lead. So this is the small correction. I'm uh, honored to be with you today. For uh, I will concentrate more on Sidra medicine because we are uh, uh, started to move as the, we are COVID-free area uh, in our organization in the country. So we are concentrating more on uh, uh, study more, uh, doing a more modification in the electronic system to help in uh, uh, the clinical pathway. So we had uh, in Qatar, uh, uh, we started uh, in three stages about sepsis. We started in 2013. We started with the uh, be sure about preventive uh, measures. Uh, be sure about uh, clean water, hand hygiene everywhere with uh, KPI, make it as a KPI for uh, the hospitals and uh, clean births, avoid the hospital acquired infection and decrease the percentage. And then the vaccination and the good vaccination program, alhamdulillah. So uh, this is the, the, the start for us in 2013. And then we started a lot of uh, uh, itchy on it, having a, a, a degree, uh, like uh, what Dr. Abdel Ilah mentioned, uh, everyone working in a level, uh, uh, certain level, and working in a certain field, but we need all together to be on uh, uh, the same line. We are all together talking about uh, uh, sepsis, uh, clinical uh, sepsis pathway and the clinical guideline that will be a unified guideline, which it will be excellent. Uh, Dr. Abdul Ilah, he sent to us about uh, the uh, Eastern Mediterranean Sepsis Alliance uh, guideline, uh, uh, thinking to develop a guideline, uh, a unified regional, which is amazing idea. This will help us much because it helps us in a regional area, in a national area, it helps us much. We unify all definitions. We unify the six item in 60 minutes, the time zero, the golden hour. We use the electronic system, the early warning system. We use uh, the sepsis screen. We built it inside the system for, uh, we started with adults then with pediatric, then like Dr. Uh, Abdel Ilah mentioned, uh, now in 2020, uh, 2020 and the 2021, we are, we, we done with the newborn in the NICU setting, in the postnatal setting, this different uh, way of screening in the system. And there is another screening also for women, pregnant, non-pregnant, according where in the birth center or in the postpartum and so on. So there is a lot, a lot of effort done in uh, the electronic system to help uh, in the national level. So this is what I wish to, to have it as, as a whole, every one of us uh, uh, share uh, what he did and what he's struggling with. About uh, what what else we did? We did uh, you, we used the Cerner for order set. Now we have uh, order set separate for pediatric, for oncology, for neonatal in ICU, neonatal postnatal, and for the woman pregnant and non-pregnant and adult post transplant. So we we have a, 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 an excellent golden hour sepsis order set. The subsequent, this is we will work on it because we have it in the power chart, in the uh, in the uh, word document, but we didn't build it yet. So this is the one of the part we are doing. The second part we are doing about uh, uh, what I will uh, uh, suggest for the others. I know I am taking a long time, but I will try to shorten it. What I'm suggesting everyone in his country to do at his country first, at his hospital first. The only, all units working similar or on the same line with the, uh, uh, making, uh, you know, adapt and adopt. 
uh, we are uh, fixing uh, uh, the, the, the guideline, the national and international guideline. We are fixing it according to the facility needs. This is very important for all of us to start with. So we have to help each other. We have to know we, which country, uh, yeah, it, it's a big effort for Dr. Abdelilah to know the, the, all the countries where we, we are and so we can be near to each other. IHI helped us much in Qatar. They did uh, multiple learning sessions for us for the National Patient Safety Collaborative. And uh, we, we learned a lot from each other, from the storyboards, from the presentation, and the how to share the challenges without feeling shy that we cannot do that and we didn't do that. We, we shared it together and we shared together how others solve it so we can solve it in the same way. Uh, about the sepsis day, Doctor, like your, your announcement, we have in uh, 6th of September, we have uh, uh, sepsis webinar for the public for two hours in Arabic and English. And uh, this is, uh, 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 it will be a one of our uh, aim in 2021 to involve public awareness, uh, about, or increase public awareness about sepsis. They are involved as a patient. We have a lot of patients and every year in the sepsis day, we have a patient story and they are sharing with us uh, their story and what happened exactly, where is the, 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 uh, the challenge, where and uh, what is the, the, the end result of that. And we have also, they, uh, they share with us in the guidelines, in the development, the workshop uh, development of the guideline. There was a representative from government, non-governmental and uh, special sector, Qatar Red Crescent, Peripheral Health Center, everybody were there including a patient with sepsis and surviving sepsis. So it was a good collaboration together and good experience to, to learn from them also, how they feel, what, what, what is the, uh, their concern, which is uh, very important for all of us. I think I cannot summarize all, but uh, for the World Sepsis Day on 13, we have a national event for the eighth year in a row, and we are hosting the Qatar AIDS National Sepsis Symposium. This is the third year uh, to, to, to lead the event uh, at, at uh, Qatar. And it is a very good one, well prepared, guided by Global Sepsis Alliance. Uh, we are doing uh, multiple, like this one, <laughs> Sepsis ban, sepsis, uh, badge, cards, uh, booklet cards uh, for the sepsis awareness for the physician and nurses, clinical flow also for the nurses. It is uh, over uh, everywhere in, in the unit, over the computer side. So they will not forget uh, the sepsis assessment and screen for every patient. Now we have the screening for all patients, all medical, surgical, ICU, emergency in all the children hospital and women hospital both and we are doing that screen we did modification of the sepsis alert in the cerner and still under validation inshallah this is one of our future and dr abdullah will join us he is kindly agree to to join us in the sepsis day on 13 september inshallah we will have also from us there is dr jahan and there is a multiple representative from Ministry of Public Health, uh, governmental HMC, CDC, Qatar, and uh, Peripheral Health Center leads, uh, and m multiple people. <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Russia. So, so actually, you've mentioned a number of interesting points, and that takes me to uh, to to Carlos. So, so you're. You're, you're a clinician, uh, you're an executive, you're public health. Uh, so let me just set the stage for my question. And, and uh, there's a saying that goes by, we're, we're in, in healthcare, we're, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm adding healthcare, in, 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 but I think this applies to many other fields. We're drowning in data, but we're, we're thirsty for wisdom. So, you know, uh, Brasham talked about uh, the, the, uh, the electronic health records, you know, we've got these uh, big, big brands, you know, Cerner's, uh, Epic, 
now there's a discussion about the post uh, EMRs and post EHRs era because if we're if we're trying to be uh, I shouldn't say even patient centered but person centered then then you know the the, the technology that we have today uh, I don't think would would help us get the, the the most out of what 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 we can get which is again keep that number in mind the the the, the the 47 million people getting sepsis, the uh, the 11 million people dying. So, you know, giving your 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 very kind of uh, you know diverse uh, and 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 very well rounded background. How how do you see the future of uh, technology really? You know, putting a dent on this number. You know. Uh, I, I mentioned in my uh, slides uh, some of the countries that reduced uh, sepsis mortality by 50%. How can we do that here in the Eastern Mediterranean? What, 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 your, you know, what are your thoughts? How can we leverage technology? What are we not doing? And you know, I, I'm, I'm very interested to hear your thoughts. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Galula. So first of all, let me say thank you for allowing me to be here and, and allowing Hillroom to support this great, great initiative. And, you know, good afternoon and good evening to those of, uh, of you who are uh, listening. Um, it's the morning here in Chicago where I live. Um, to address your question, I think, you know, technology companies um, are, are learning the lesson, right? That this is not just about producing a solution that is gonna give some sort of information without any context of, or anything like that. So as we move forward, I think there is an evolution in terms of what makes a good technology, technological solution, a great clinical solution. And I think that one of the things that we have learned is for something to be successful, for technology to be successful, it needs to be integrated with knowledge, with the clinical knowledge, and that really needs to be integrated in the clinical workflow. And you brought up a point about, you know, we're drowning in information, but we actually need wisdom. So here's some characteristics that I wanna share with the audience around, you know, the things that we have learned that makes information useful and sort of like, I'm gonna use your analogy of transforming to, into, into wisdom, so to speak. So first of all, information needs to be accurate. And in sepsis, information to be accurate, it needs to be, it means that it needs to be timely and frequency. So it has like a very specific component in sepsis. Now, information needs to be meaningful. In sepsis, to be meaningful, it means it means that it must be trended. You know, we talk about those patients, like you know, you talk about the South South Wales example where the patient is is sort of going down in that journey. So that information needs to be trended. Um, but information needs to be precise. But in order to be precise in sepsis, it means that it needs context, right? What are those patient characteristics? What are the labs? Uh, Dr. Rasha was mentioning how they differentiate, you know, the pregnant person versus the non-pregnant patient. So that context is very important for, for sepsis. Now, information needs to be actionable. And to be actionable, the information needs to be connected to agree upon clinical pathways. You know, we talk about the get three, get two, like, you know, what is the clinical pathway that helps that information that helps the patient? And then information needs to be predictive. And in order for information to be predictive, we learned that you need to have at least three vital signs with a context above. So my message, you know, to the regional alliance is as we think about technology, as we think about solutions, um, and I'm not saying that a technology solution needs to have all of these components, but but when you look at a technology, look at it in the bigger context of what is the information that you're getting from that technology and how are those sort of components of the technology gonna help you, you know, treat the patient and get the information that you need holistically. And maybe, you know, my last thought are, you know, we think about it in terms of very pragmatic way about building blocks. So as you think about those building blocks, so you have to think about what is the platform? So the platform is what, you know, we will make, you know, maybe a good way to say it is the hardware, you know, what are the sensors, the laboratory? So the wizard information, the input that you need to make decisions and where the analytics resides with information that is necessary for the analytics. So what is sort of the platform that you're utilizing? You know, what are the applications? The applications are, you know, those softwares that help you automate and calculate that information and the workflow that we were talking about. What is the system or the device that you're gonna use or both the device? You know, we talk about electronic health records. 
does the environment have that? And if the environment doesn't have that, is the information that you can do on the device? Or is there information that you can go on, on the cloud? Like you need to start thinking really about the environment and, and where or how that system should interact or, or devices should interact. And finally, you know, think about how those systems are focusing on, on surveillance, of course, and treatment. And that's where communication comes into place. And that's where integration into the workflow comes into place. So integration into the clinical workflow specifically. So, so that's just sort of like the message, you know, it's like, as, as you think about these solutions, try to think about holistically, you know, what is the platform, what's the application, what's the system, and what is the information, as I mentioned yesterday about, uh, I'm sorry, earlier about accuracy, meaningful precision, and how you're looking into this. So that is the way that I will, um, you know, recommend we think about technology, um, and then how do we apply that technology is specific to the environment and the clinical needs um, as we try to address sepsis. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Carlos. So, so now we move to uh, Dr. Emmanuel. And uh, again, you're, you're, uh, uh, you're an infectious disease uh, consultant. You've worked in uh, the UK, you're working in the UAE, you're, 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 a, you're a board member of, of the Global Sepsis Alliance and you're the chair of uh, African Sepsis Alliance. So may, maybe uh, if you could just give us a little bit of uh, idea about your, your, your time in the UK, because uh, you, you, had, you had a very interesting uh, title of the, the Associate Clinical Director of, for Deterioration and Sepsis. So that's, that's very interesting uh, to, 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 if you could just give us a little bit of background about that. And then uh, I'm interested to hear about your efforts in, in the, in your work in the UAE, but also the work in, 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 in ASA, in the African Sepsis Alliance. Thank you. Thank you, Abdel. And it's really a, a pleasure to, to be here. Thank you for inviting, inviting me. Um, it's really exciting because, as you say, I'm working in the Middle East at the moment, working in, uh, in the UAE, in, in um, Sheikh Shagbud Medical City, which is part of the uh, big government uh, health network here called Saha. And they're doing a lot of sepsis improvement work in, in Saha. And so it's exciting to see the EMSA taking off and uh, we hope that we will be part, part of, of this. Um, your, your first question was about um, um, the UK and the journey and the, how I got involved in deterioration and sepsis in the UK. And my, it, my, sto my, my sepsis, I, we, we all have stories about sepsis and my story is sepsis is quite personal because I, I um, initially started in 2008 um, and I, I lost a very close friend um, with sepsis in, in hospital. Um, she was pregnant, uh, 30 weeks uh, pregnant, um, and a set of twins, and developed sepsis in hospital um, after a cervical um, string, cervical cerclage. And it wasn't recognized on, in, in a timely manner. She didn't get antibiotics. They took blood cultures, and they left her. And um, in the morning, she, she, she arrested. She had a chemist and I actually went to resuscitate her. Um, and unfortunately she passed away um, with the twins. So it's quite raw, um, if, uh, this is my story of sepsis and it still is when I, when I talk about it. But at that point in 2008, I was a junior doctor and it, I, it was traumatizing and I couldn't, I couldn't think of how it could happen in hospital. It, this is not out of hospital sepsis coming into hospital, this is in hospital. And not still not not recognized in a in a hospital in in the UK, and so the, I initially decided to just finish my training and then move to Liverpool as a consultant in infectious disease infectious diseases, and then a few months into the job, enjoying the job in Liverpool, the same thing happened. Um, a patient who came through an emergency um, into um, our ward, infectious disease ward, and ended up in intensive care and had sepsis, also wasn't recognized, went home and wrote a complaint letter, um, which I read. And after that, I decided something needed to change. And I took the complaint letter to the medical director and said, what, what are we gonna do about this? We have to change um, and we have to change the hospital 
the system has to change. We can't just keep reminding people to recognize sepsis and treat sepsis. We need to change the whole hospital. We have to redesign the hospital, the culture, the team, build teams and develop systems. And thankfully, we had the support. And so we started doing that in the Royal Liverpool Hospital and completely changed systems and built a sepsis team. And that led to, to recognition that we were doing something good in Liverpool and it extended to a regional alliance in, in the UK. And then also I got involved in national work as, 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 as a clinical advisor for sepsis. But very quickly with the sepsis role in, the, in, in Liverpool, we realized that sepsis, it, you can't manage sepsis on its own. It's all about deterioration. People don't come into hospital with sepsis written on their forehead. Uh, and it's all about patients. So you have to design a system that can identify critically ill patients, wh whatever illness they have, and sepsis is part of that pool. And a system that can that design to recognize sick patients and respond will also um, address sepsis. And that is how the role of sepsis in, in Liverpool um, became quite quickly a sepsis and deterioration. And also the national role for, for sepsis, lead role for sepsis was deterioration and sepsis. And because patients, uh, as, as, as um, Dr. Rasha was, was, was describing, patients were coming on well with a high early warning score and you need to screen them for sepsis and then take action. And if it's not sepsis, they, need, they still need, need to be, to be, to be, to be, they still need to be a quick response. So that is how um, the, the work we were doing for sepsis became a deterioration, a wider deterioration role. How do we identify sick patients in hospital and how do we respond to sick patients, in, including sepsis? And that led to us developing tools like electronic sepsis, um, electronically um, um, using mu scores uh, and a system to automatically identify patients with high early warning score and screen them for sepsis with all the data that you have in the system with all the blood results, um, uh, vital signs, lab data that we already have in the system and then prompting uh, physicians and nurses to do the right thing. And we were able to show there with, with e-sepsis how we could reduce mortality uh, for, for sepsis. So that is uh, sort of the, the, the background and, and um, with sepsis and, and, and deterioration. The, the irony, well, I'm originally from Cameroon and the work with sepsis in the UK led to a work with the Global Sepsis Alliance. And it, I became very uncomfortable about the fact that a lot of work was going on in the UK um, with involved my involvement and also in, in with the Global Sepsis Alliance. And they were, we didn't see the scale of improvement happening in, 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 in Africa, where I'm originally from, from, from Cameroon. I'm from Cameroon originally. And so I became distinctly uncomfortable about that. And then we realized that um, uh, we had some of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Kamal, who was supposed to be here today, and, and, and others that had set up the African Sepsis Alliance. And we started having discussions about how we could, we could um, drive real improvement in sepsis across Africa with the help of the Global Sepsis Alliance. And as usual, the Global Sepsis Alliance stepped in and also supported us. We started the journey of, of we set up the Sepsis Alliance and then uh, African Sepsis Alliance. And then since then we've done quite a lot. It's been a sort of a, a, a race and a journey um, for sepsis improvement. But the highlights, I would say, in terms of the work we've done so far, and the lessons was collaboration and collaboration. And I think um, you've mentioned that already. And you don't really know where the collaboration is going to lead you. But when you're doing sepsis improvement at a regional level or global level, you have to develop strong collaboration. And we started off with the African Federation of Critical Care Nurses, who have uh, already because sepsis tends to be linked with critical care. They were also very well organized. And um, we had an initial um, involvement with them and, and then went initially into training and set up the, our first um, sepsis symposium in Uganda um, at that point in 2017. And that was when we also um, 
uh, developed the um, the Kampala resolution, which was a re resolution describing the problem of sepsis in Africa, why in Africa it's different, and why we and what we need to do to improve sepsis in 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 Africa, and we use that as also an, as an advocacy tool to raise awareness and attention about the the need for sepsis improvement in in Africa. But the the other um, key thing we've done is is and you mentioned that initially is about how research can also drive improvements. So we were fortunate in terms of partnerships that some of the people involved in the African Sips Alliance were also part of academic institutions. So um, the opportunity became available to apply for a grant. The National Institute for Health Research in the UK was um, advertised um, a, a pro for proposals to do research on an, an illness that was neglected and of importance in low and middle income countries. And so we, we thought, oh, this is an opportunity and decided to partner with Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine with colleagues who were also interested in sepsis research and other stakeholders. And we were lucky that in 2019, we were successful in, in getting a grant of roughly two million pounds to um, do sepsis research in Africa try to cue a big uh, African um, research collaboration on sepsis. So the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine uh, has set up the African research collaboration of sepsis with our help and the help of stakeholders. And we now have a network of 10 um, sites in Africa uh, working together to do research and answer some of the really important research questions about sepsis in Africa. For example, what is the burden of disease and, and, and prognostic markers for sepsis in Africa. So there's a short incident study, which is ongoing and soon, and soon to be completed amongst these 10 sites in Africa. And also we're working on, we're just going to, uh, about to finish a study looking at quality indicators for sepsis in Africa. We're going through a Delphi um, um, process. So the reason I'm highlighting this is, is how, how research can also help drive re, um, uh, development and, and drive improvements in, in services. In terms of training, um, we, uh, one, one also important, well, the sepsis symposia, which I've mentioned, every year we have tried to have a sepsis symposium and COVID, it hasn't been um, easy in the last couple of years. But this year, for example, we're, we have partnered with the International Sepsis Forum. And for the first time, the, in the Africa will be hosting the International Sepsis Forum, which will be hosted by Rwanda, um, the Rwandan Emergency Care Association and the African Sepsis Alliance. So it's also a plug for the 28th to the 29th of October this year, the International Sepsis Forum will be hosted by the African Sepsis Alliance. And we plan to deliver sepsis education and training for all healthcare care workers focusing on on issues from africa and it's free going to be free of charge and 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 it's going to be virtual uh, as well as a a, a um, in, in country um event so please join us on the 28th to the 29th of october and the world sepsis um alliance is going to be uh, promoting it so please and we'll, we will be sending invites out so please uh, join us doing that symposium. But again, it's just showing how, how education and training is important and how a regional alliance uh, uh, can help with training uh, healthcare professionals and at, 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 at continental level. One of the things we really wanted to do also was set up strong national sepsis alliances. Because as a regional alliance, you really can't uh, influence large-scale change within the country without strong national alliances. So um, our objective has been to develop as many national alliances as we can that are fully functional and strong. And the Sudanese Sepsis Alliance, which is chaired by um, Dr. Kamal, who, who was supposed to join and couldn't today, is an example. And they have strong links with the Ministry of Health, they have a, a Sudanese Student Sepsis Alliance, which is very also very functional, 
with an, with an alumni group that also drives sepsis improvement. They have patients involved in their group. They have, that, um, have strong guidelines linked to, to stewardship, antimicrobial stewardship. And our objective every year has been to, as we have a symposium in one country, to leave there setting up and, and, and supporting uh, development of, of the national alliances. At the moment, we have 15 and that are, co are currently part of, of, the, of the African Sepsis Alliance out of 54 countries. Um, so that sort of gives you a feel of what we're doing. There are a lot of challenges. I would say in terms of challenge, and I think it's something I really need to mention, and, and, and Conrad uh, touched on that, we need to involve the public. And talking about sepsis and sepsis improvement in the healthcare sector on our own is not going to lead to significant change in sepsis if the public is not involved, if politicians are not involved. We have to take it from the healthcare um, setting out to the public. When we, in the UK, when um, a member of the public, when the mother has, been, has raised a problem with, with sepsis mismanagement um, to the ministry, Minister of Health about their child and it goes to parliament, that is when real change happens, when it's discussed in parliament. And so we need to tell patients stories about sepsis and we need to also get it to the public sector. Public sector. And that is the challenge that we've had in, in the African Sepsis Alliance. This is what we, we're really working on, 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 on now, getting sepsis into the public sector. And so we're currently working on, a, on an awareness video for the public. We're using social media to get the public to understand what sepsis is. Because they all know, they all have, we've all had somebody who's passed away or had been affected by sepsis, most, of, most often they don't just know it was sepsis. So the more people are aware about sepsis, the more we can advocate for improvement and get politicians and leaders involved in sepsis improvement. I think I'll stop, I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel. Uh, so basically, uh, what I'm going to do moving, you know, is, is, is to ask you, uh, as we're moving forward, you know, as, as IMSA, as, as um, uh, countries within the region, uh, what, what, what would be uh, kind of, you know, the, 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 the direction that we, we, should, we should take to get, to get some traction to, to deal with this big problem? So, so I'll, I'll start with 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 uh, with Conrad and 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 uh, maybe uh, in, in in two or three minutes, uh, if, if, if every one of you to 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 give us an answer. Uh, what what do we need to do uh, here in 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 EMSA re regarding sepsis? You know, so if I'm if I'm listening to you from you know uh, one of the countries of, of, of the region, what, based on your experience, what, what, what would you recommend, uh, you know, should I focus on, on work uh, within, within, within hospitals? Should I focus on uh, maybe trying to reach out to the Ministry of Health or to, to, to some other uh, important stakeholders? Uh, so that's, that's one part. And then also, you know what about the the, the public? Any any ideas for for the for the public? You know one of the things in in EMSA that we're interested in is is maybe uh, coming up with with an e-learning platform, uh, and this does not need to be EMSA or only. Maybe it can be an EMSA ASA uh, uh, initiative. So uh, from 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 training and from capacity building, because this has been a recurring theme. Uh, in, in discussions and, and, and you can see that this is one of the uh, items of, of the uh, of the resolution but but if you just have a, an advice for for EMSA uh, an advice for the for the countries within EMSA what you know what would be the kind of the two three uh, areas that you would recommend Conrad you can you can go ahead okay thanks <clears throat> I think um... Emmanuel has um, mentioned uh, some really crucial uh, points and um, just, and he, of course you have asked a, a lot of questions and um, 
I would like to start with, uh, because Emmanuel mentioned his mother uh, who has lost her child through poor service because she, she seeked help for one week and NHS uh, did not react appropriately. And Jeremy Hunt, she visited Jeremy Hunt. And you may remember what Jeremy Hunt said in this opening session of our last World Sepsis Congress, that she came to him with a puppet and said, in the puppet are the ashes of my child. And I think this is so moving. And we need indeed along the lines what we can learn from other successful, let me call it communities like the cancer community, really to address the public, but even more so the political stakeholders who are by law, at least in countries like Germany, which they don't follow, but I think it's true for most countries, uh, <clears throat> responsible for the well-being of their people. And what they need to do about sepsis is quite clear. If it's true, and it is true, that this is a main killer, we, we must help them to understand this. And th so that's, that's, that's one, one point. And you need also, despite different cultures, I think, try to work uh, with survivors, with families who have lost their last loved ones, et cetera, et cetera. This, was especially helpful, uh, at least in the regions uh, we know the US, UK, and 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 others. And the second thing is research, because if you look at the success factors that we had, both for the Global Sepsis Alliance and now also starting in Germany has only happened because we were able to create data on the global level, but also on the national and the regional level. And <clears throat> the progress is that now we have also the global burden of disease report. And if you look up in the supplement, what I have done when I did a speech uh, some time ago, also for the EMSA region, and I, if I remember co correctly, there is uh, about 1 million uh, uh, deaths in the whole uh, region or, or uh, and, and, and so, so, and this needs to be done as good as possible also on the country levels. And, and so, because only with this data combined with personal tragedies and uh, you, will get successful as Emmanuel has been with his hospital administration. And of course, I, and, and I learned also from, from Russia what, what, for example, it has been achieved in the Emirates. Uh, uh, and it's not, it's not limited to Qatar. I think it's, it's, it's for a quite number. It's, it's quite impressive. And I think jointly with the regional directors of WHO and the national representatives and uh, national coalitions you need, which was always also part of our philosophy to create national coalitions because from infectious diseases to from emergency medicine uh, to intensive care medicine, but also the other uh, medical specialties like uh, not only family doc, but also surgery, uh, obstetrics, etc. So, so, so I think this is this is the way, and there are so many similarities uh, between patient safety and 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 uh, this is what also learn, we had to learn that those who are take care uh, for patient safety are our greatest allies. 
uh, and 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 because it's the number one cause of preventable death. So 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 that's I, I think there is a lot of arguments here, uh, and not only the fact that uh, COVID also results in in safety. So that that's a great opportunity that you need to do. And lastly, I wanted to mention that also there is a lot of money out there also for research, for example, by the German government who set out grants to improve healthcare in sub-Saharan uh, uh, Africa. Africa. And, um, and, and, and we applied for it and successfully applied for it. We are now granted for six months to develop a, a big program, which we are doing jointly with with ASA and, and the African Research Collaboration. And, and we will involve quite a number of countries in Africa. So there's a lot of things going on, and this may apply also for the for the uh, for your region for, for, for EMSA. So that's I think is the way to go. Thank you very much, uh, Conrad. So so uh... I'll, I'll, I'll move to, to Dr. Rasha uh, again uh, in, in two minutes or so. What would you recommend that we focus on in, in, in the region? Uh, what, because we're looking at collaboration. I think, I think collaboration, so, so the same way that you're trying to, to get an initiative done in a hospital, you need collaboration. Within within you know different uh, healthcare workers. If you're trying to do an initiative within a, within a country, you need collaboration within different levels. Now, at the level of EMSA, what sort of collaborative initiatives that you you would recommend? You know, two or three initiatives that you 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 can think of uh, to to help uh, reduce the uh, the morbidity and mortality of sepsis. Well. Uh... It is a difficult, by the way, very difficult question. <laughs> but uh, I will. I, I believe that it is uh, always start from the unit, unit, then department, then hospital, then hospitals, organization, government, and private, and available, and then after that to to go to the regional area. So uh, I think we need, like Dr. Corner, he mentioned, we need. Uh, certain groups, certain leaders from each country to be involved with the, at the start. We cannot start with the front line. Front line and the education and all of this, this is a second step, not the first. The first to go direct to the leadership in each country and tell them about how serious is the condition, how, how is, uh, it is a global crisis, emergency situation for like the COVID now, it, it is pandemic and it is sepsis in, in uh, most of our, the deaths in, in it uh, most likely with that. So uh, I think the leadership involvement is very important. Leadership, not only from the Ministry of Public Health, it is also it should be from the uh, uh, private sectors leadership from uh, the quality improvement team we have uh, we have a great team working with us and uh, we learned a lot from from the quality team how to 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 work this sepsis uh, workflow data how is the data accurate or no and uh, validation and so on so they helped us much so the leaders of the quality should be involved with also in uh, in this situation the leaders of the electronic system their country also should be there then they can meet together and put together the, the clinical pathway the guideline and uh, how the strategy will be then the, each each country can go ahead the, to, to work with this plan we will put for them. This is the most important for collaboration to start with the small units, but through their leaders, not through the units themselves. Then the second will be the education. We are so lucky in Sidra. Sidra started to open the door in 2017. So we are very new, organ big organization. So uh, uh, we had multiple simulation sessions multiple education about the sepsis before starting to work, 
before having the, receiving the patient. You got my point. So the national uh, effort helped us much to have uh, this great uh, uh, result, and we had a uh, enough time for training. So I, I think the education after collaboration, the education is very, very important. The last thing I, 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 I wanted to mention about the accuracy of the data, like Dr. Corner mentioned. This is what, uh, what I'm doing in the last three years. I'm doing uh, uh, change, BDSA cycles, change data, this is okay, manual data at the start and now electronic data and checking the validation of the both data and then telling yes, the system is working right. So it is not something easy or something you, you, you will just tell the, uh, the countries, you will follow one, two, three, it will come. No, it is something difficult, need to insist on uh, and people uh, having their their heart in in the work, not uh, people just working. You know, uh, this is no protected time, no nothing. You will come except from God the reward. So we have to have such a people. We have to search for them and teach them, and then start to to work among the, the countries together. For the last word, for the mor mortality, most of you talk about mortality. I am a pediatrician, so I am seeing the morbidity, which is horrible. Sometimes I'm saying, if he die, it will be much better for the family. I'm having patients with sepsis from the streptinemony, then CB patient, become cerebral palsy. What is that? Very bad future. Stiff patient, handicapped, bedridden patient, a lot of problem, and so on. So this is, it was normal child, just two sepsis got that situation. And I have two or three lost their kidney. One of the kidney because of UTI, temple UTI, turned to be sepsis after that, and uh, uh, renal abscesses and drain multiple time and then lost the renal tissue. So there is a lot of morbidity that uh, we have to, to, to share the morbidity also with the people. And if they know that, that their life, the morbidity, some of them in the pediatric age group and in the neonatal age group, by the way, their life much horrible than dying, they, they will feel how it is serious we have to work on it. And education, doctor. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, uh, Dr. Rasha. So, so uh, uh, Carlos, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Rasha mentioned uh, the, the the public, and we we we, you know, I think through all of your discussions, we mentioned public, and you know, we talked about advocacy. So, uh, what what are other uh, practical solutions that we can empower because we could advocate for the public, you know, we can get them involved. But then uh, I'll, I'll give you an example, you know, the, the technology helped us in other fields, you know, years ago, if you wanted to fly from one place to another, you had to go to uh, a travel agent and you had to buy a ticket. And so, right. so, so now you do everything on one app, uh, you know, uh, etc. So that empowered the, the 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 consumer. Now, how can we empower the public uh, when it comes to 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 the issue of sepsis? You know, from uh, pre uh, pre infection prevention as well as early recognition. Uh, uh, what 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 uh, what potential uh, you know uh, options are there in in, in terms of uh, empowering people with technology in sepsis? Yeah, the dribble, I think you're bringing up a great analogy. I think even today, when we think about engaging the public via um, campaigns and things like that, we're relying on people's sort of like cognitive burden, right? We, we're making it on them, their brains to remember and to engage. And technology, you know, we have seen things like in Apple where like you're, you're now being able to track people's heart rates, for example. Uh, there is technology who are able to track people EKGs, maybe if it's, if it's even a single lead EKG. So I think there are certainly opportunities as we continue to see more patients being remotely monitored through iFit and things like that. So now the evidence is not there yet, uh, but the technology is, is getting there. Um, uh, 
Apple Watch actually demonstrated that they could identify um, HRP relation, you know, through the monitoring. So we, we, and I'm, I'm going to say society, we need to start thinking about what are the opportunities where we kind of start investing in automated ways to identify septic patients. Uh, this is where artificial intelligence comes into mind. And some people are talking about this big data analytics or big data analysis. So could there be a future where um, I'm going to use, you know, one of those portable voice assist devices that says, hey, you know, Alexa or sepsis, this is not a, a commercial to any particular device. We're not associated with any of them that you can say, hey, I have a fever. And then that person or say, hey, I, you know, what to do with a fever, that person maybe or that device helps with a couple more questions, you know, to start, you know, thinking of those, those data analysis. Unfortunately, we're still in a very like wishful thinking type of like, you know, big ideas, futuristic point of view, but there is definitely an entry point where technology can play that role. We're, we're not relying on people's knowledge or people's remembering or understanding of the disease. And we can rely on all this automation and information that it tells there to help us identify uh, patients at, at, at the, at, you know, with the potential to become septic. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos. So, so Emmanuel, uh, way forward, uh, you know, what, what advice do you have? I mean, you mentioned a number of your initiatives. Uh, what, what, what areas, uh, you know, in two, three minutes, what, what potential areas of collaboration that we can have with, 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 uh, between EMSA and ASA, as well as what, what, what do you think about the idea of having an e-learning uh, platform uh, that that I think would would really help with 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 getting uh, uh, building capacity in, in 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 many healthcare professionals within within both regions. Thanks. Um, really useful question. I think in terms of collaboration, there is a lot that we can do, and this is I think one of the. I think the beginning of, of, of it, I think in terms of education and joint conferences, um, in terms of education platform, we actually had that in our action plan initially about having an electronic platform for healthcare workers, which we haven't managed to take to fruition, um, but it's something that we want to revisit. And that's certainly something that we would, we would be very interested to discuss between EMSA and, and, and ASA, how we can set that up. Um, in terms of other collaboration, research is, is really important and working, being an ID physician and working in the Middle East, um, one of the things that we've found really useful with, with ASA is as, as EMSA and the leaders in EMSA, I think we need to articulate what's, uh, what's the key issues about sepsis in, in the Middle East and what really needs to change because it's not the same as in Europe or in North America, just like it's very different from Africa. And one common problem we, we would, would have is antimicrobial resistance. And, and not only can we collaborate in terms of research um, with, within AMR, but it's, some, so, so it's something that we also get a lot of traction in terms of working with the WHO and also government in terms of getting in with sepsis improvement if you link sepsis with antimicrobial resistance. The, the opportunities the mid, in the Middle East, what having worked in the UK, worked in Africa, now in the Middle East, what you see in the Middle East is um, health systems that are relatively strong, uh, public health systems that are strong, health systems that are strong across most of the countries in the Middle East. Certainly, I can say that in the, in the UAE. And well-resourced as well. So strong public health system, strong health system, and well-resourced, uh, such as with example, with electronic patient records. We've heard about the, um, the example from Qatar in Saha in Abu Dhabi. It's exactly the same. All the government health services uh, hospitals are networked with electronic have records with large amount of data. And that also provides opportunity for research, um, which across sites in, 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 in the Middle East. So I think that is something which 
I think you need to brainstorm, but you need to identify where those opportunities are in the Middle East and what, what you can capitalize on them. For example, is it using large data? Because there's all this, most of these countries have health systems that are linked with electronic patient records. How can you use some of that to answer some of the questions about what the burden of disease is of sepsis in the Middle East? What are the key prognostic markers in the Middle East? How important is antimicrobial resistance? Um, are there examples really and publishable examples of how outcomes have improved, large scale improvements in substance improvement, as you've seen in, 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 in the US and, and data from the UK? And, and lastly, I would say, um, I mean, the assumption is that the causes of antimic of, of sepsis in the in the Middle East are similar to other parts of the world, but as you would in, in Africa, it's it's not exactly the same. Um, the studies in Africa have shown a lot of uh, zoonosis being a, a significant cause of, of sepsis in, Afri in Africa, um, with things like acute fever, leptospirosis, etc., et which is not the same in, in, in Europe or, 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 or in, in North America. And the same applies for um, issues such as uh, management, uh, fluid management, in Africa is not the same as fluid management in the in, in US and the UK, with studies that have shown higher mortality with both of fluid administration in Africa in children as well as in adults. So the, the point I'm making there is that research is really important because we, we can't assume that the causes of sepsis in the Middle East are the same as other parts of the world and the response to sepsis it should be the same. We may have similar principles, but I think if we if we deep down the research, we, you, you will, the research question, we'll find that there are probably some, some differences. And I think we need to, as a group, articulate why we need to focus on sepsis improvement in the Middle East and why we need to do it a bit differently. Um, the last thing I would say is what I also see in the Middle East is the responsiveness. So it's fascinating to see how um, in, in the Middle East, a leader takes responsibility for change and then things happen very quickly. Uh, a shake and say, this is, this is going to happen and you see the change happen and it happens very quickly. It's not the same in other parts of the world. And that's a, that's a big opportunity. And so I think it's an opportunity for EMSA to build on this particularity in the Middle East and this opportunity of having leaders that can bring about large scale change and very quickly. Uh, and when people, when they say things are going to happen, it's going to happen. And so if you get those people involved in substance improvement, I'm pretty certain you'll see a significant change in the Middle East. And so that's what we know. We really need to take substance improvement, make them understand what substance improvement is and get them involved. Because I think with their help, you would see drastic changes in the, in the Middle East with substance improvement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Very, very good insight. I know that we we, we ran out of time, but there's a, an interesting question that uh, um, maybe one of you could answer in a, in a minute or so. So there was a question about uh, genomics and, and metagenomics. So, so do you think that the whole gene of metagenomics for unknown pathogens in sepsis cases could help? This has been tested in University of San Francisco and it showed uh, promising results. So any, any, any takers that would want to answer this uh, maybe in a, in a minute or so? I can probably as an ID physician answer that. Okay. I, I, I would, the simple answer is, oh yes, yes, and yes. I mean, working in the Middle East for the last two years, it's fascinating that infections that you think are not here are actually here when you start looking at looking at them and, and making and doing the right investigations. So we see people who come in sick with sepsis who would have probably thought was just a bacterial infection, a common bacterial infection, E. coli, and then they've got Q fever, they've got leptospirosis. Uh, and and we've, we're seeing that quite regularly here and some things that we didn't think existed here as much as before, just because we've got the people who can look at for these infections and also can do the right investigation. So I certainly think genomics and meta and genomics can help. And if we, that's really what I was, I was driving to, was saying that we need studies about the causes of sepsis because we think we know, but we may not actually know. And, and that will also help us determine what the cause of sepsis in this part of the world and also how to prevent them. I mean, example is, is brucellosis. The amount of, of brucellosis that we, we also see when you start looking for brucellosis, 
um, and asking the right questions from the history is, is, is also interesting. And so there's probably more, um, brucellosis is more of an, a cause of sepsis here than other parts of the world. As, but how big it is um, um, for the patient that's coming into hospital? We simply don't know. And this is where um, genomics or metagenomics can help. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Uh, Dr. Rashid, did, did you want to answer this question as well? No, no I, I have a, just a comment. Uh, I, I noticed now during our discussion, every one of us having a lot of information in his mind, but a total different level than the other. You got my point? So, and we are working in sepsis for long, long years. What about the other area? The people, they are not, not working with sepsis or working with a very limited resources or working in isolation, isolated units. So I think it is better for, for us as the uh, uh, Eastern Mediterranean Sepsis Alliance to think how, how we can unify first, how we can involve everyone, not only certain countries. We, we can encourage other countries to be with us, and then we will start to be, to, to, to think all together. We are thinking about one, two, three, four as a frame, not to go and jump to the biomarkers or uh, genes or, or uh, organisms or something like this. Because I, I'm feeling it, it is, it is so heavy to think about, uh, uh, let us do a research about, it is very important. But uh, uh, I think in our countries, we need more to know that there is sepsis, people working on sepsis to prevent one, two, three, four. You got my point? There is multiple people when you do a, a, a survey before starting doing anything in any country, you will, you, you will get surprised from the data. You will get surprised that the, uh, are there still people they, they don't know about sepsis? They don't know about sepsis bundle and about how serious it is? Yes, and they are in the health care, which is more, more important. You got my point, Absolutely. what I noticed? Absolutely. Well, well again, again, this, this, uh, this, this takes me back to the, to, the, to, the, uh, to, to the resolution. I think all these different aspects, that's why the resolution was, was, was is, and, and it is a great document because with, uh, it, it covers every aspect of those. And, 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 and I think the message, and we all know in healthcare, there's no one size fits all. I think, but, but you need to start somewhere. So we're, we're thinking about this from a change management uh, perspective. You know, again, I, I, I thank you very much for, 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 for your time. Uh, apologies for going over time, but, but all usually, you know, with these very interesting uh, topics, I mean, with the, with the, with the, with the, with the magnitude of a, of a problem that, you know, we're calling uh, the, the, basically the, uh, uh, the uh, it, it's 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 a, an overlooked pandemic. You know these issues of sepsis of patient safety. These are overlooked pandemic. The the, the globe is is uh, completely focused on 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 this pandemic, which is an important thing to do. But I think when you overlook such a big problem uh, uh, with with uh, sequelae, either in in people dying or 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 just having uh, you know chronic problems to dealing with, you know, not to mention the the uh, the, the impact on the economy. Uh, I think we can do much better. I think again, uh, I, I I really would 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 want us to to kind of uh, go back and look at the resolution, look at whatever points in the resolution that you can you can work with. You know, you, you don't have to do all the heavy lifting. Just look at which areas that you could start with. You know, we, we know that there is uh, room for improvement in every item, you know, be it research, be it training, be it so. So, so pick one thing and, 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 and try to, to move forward with it. But I think there's strength in numbers uh, and, and, and having a platform where we could collaborate. I think this is where innovation happens. This is where new ideas happen. Uh, uh, you know, even advanced healthcare systems are 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 struggling with 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 this problem, and 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 uh, 
patients continue to uh, to be harmed and, and 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 preventable harm continues to happen so don't think that uh, you know because you're in this region or that region that you don't have uh, you know uh, innovative ideas i can tell you that sometimes innovation comes from uh, you know uh, uh, kind of difficulties in resources not necessarily just from having you know a lot of uh, resources uh, uh, available so please, uh, you know, tell your friends about uh, EMSA. Well, you know, everyone here on, on the call uh, could collaborate with us either individually or through your organizations. And uh, you know, you could you could talk to us on the website on on, on uh, and 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 we we can we can uh, you know get back to you on on how we can collaborate. Uh, I think everyone could could move uh, this agenda forward and could could improve uh, things. So with that, I would like to uh, to thank you for listening. I would like to thank uh, Tex for for the introduction. I would like to thank uh, our esteemed panel, uh, you know, Conrad, Emmanuel, uh, Russia, and, and and Carlos uh, for 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 a great uh, conversations. And again, don't forget. Uh, September 13th, don't forget September 17th. Do not forget the uh, event that Dr. Rasha mentioned, uh, in their, their, their national uh, forum. And do not forget the events that uh, Emmanuel also uh, mentioned. And uh, again, uh, one, one, one life, saved from from this discussion i think is is a, is a worthy cause of of us spending 90 minutes or so uh talking about it but i think we're 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 we're, we're looking for for way more and i think we're, we're pretty much capable of uh of, of way more so with that uh i hope you enjoy the, the rest of the day and and hopefully we'll we'll continue collaborating in the future you take care thank you thank you